Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, AI on Demand, Data Science and Operations. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Michael O'Connell, our Chief Analytics Officer here at TIPCO Software. Without further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Michael O'Connell. Well, thanks. Uh, excited to be here to talk about one of our favorite topics, AI on Demand, Data Science and Operations, making the most of your AI machine learning model uh, in, uh, in operations. You know, there's been a number of uh, success stories for AI, um, anomaly detection in manufacturing, recommender systems in e-commerce, patient diagnosis in healthcare, and many others. We're gonna focus on a few of those today uh, and show you how this, how this works. One thing that's in common with all successful AI and ML projects is that they have a real-time component where the analysis and the insights are obtained on historical data, but they're applied to real-time data in motion. And when you think about it, all, time, all data begin as a real-time event. We accumulate those data into data lakes and so on to do uh, analytics uh, where we find insights, but the insights are perishable. So you need to take action when you get a new similar situation on an event stream. That's the uh, power and the commonality across these success uh, stories. So AI has been around a long time. You know, if I just take a look at my timeline, you know, back in the 90s, I, I worked on some diagnostic uh, instruments that went into hospitals that had uh, AI built inside of them. We had uh, algorithms for um, understanding the, uh, and identifying bacteria from, uh, from growth um, media, uh, and then applying uh, various antibiotics, figuring out the minimum inhibitory concentration, and making a recommendation you know, to the uh, attending physician about how that patient could be treated. Now that's back in the 90s and those were algorithms like the generalized additive model, various rules tables that we sat with experts to get um, a tree of, of a knowledge based system that we developed. Uh, and so, you know, this AI stuff's been going on a long time and it's really the combination of, of those that is history that we have with algorithms with more and more data and with cloud compute that's created the, the current uh, buzz. Now, going forward a little bit from there, in the 90s to 2007 or so, um, uh, I was following with great interest the Netflix prize. So Netflix put up a million dollar prize for who could create a recommender engine that uh, best recommended movies to, to, to their viewers. And this is back in the days when they were mailing around uh, DVDs. Uh, and uh, the team from uh, Bell Labs uh, ended up winning uh, that competition. Um, and uh, by combining a variety of algorithms and data processing uh, pieces together in an ensemble, uh, that was a big buzz around 2007. Now then the iPhone landed in 2008 or so. Uh, I remember being really fascinated with Shazam, still am, uh, and getting applications to run you know, on the iPhone. And back in uh, 2012, 2016, uh, really got involved in uh, medical review, uh, pharmaceutical analysis of uh, clinical trials graphically and with modeling. Uh, and now we have a partner working in that area, Perkin Elmer, who has a product, a Signals Medical Review, that embodies uh, some of that work. And then just this last year, um, TIPCO Spotfire 10, uh, written X, pronounced 10, uh, has its own inbuilt AI engine. So I imagine that a lot of you uh, today have this similar sort of journey over the last 10, 20 years, where you've seen the uh, evolution of, um, of such uh, AI and ML systems really starting to uh, take hold. So I'm going to go through a couple of, uh, with that as backdrop, a couple of the AI success areas. Um, so recommender systems. This was um, popularized by Amazon selling uh, products. Um, you know, people who bought this uh, also like this. And so, uh, you know, if you're buying this, then we're going to propose you this other thing that that similar person liked. That's the idea of a recommender uh, system for retail, at least. Uh, and then this, this uh, commonality in someone's wardrobe around and proposing uh, similar uh, items. If you bought this, you might also like this, those kinds of things where you're looking through, you know, vast amounts of transaction data to come up with those association rules uh, to, um, you know, give out a, a suggestion. So a bunch of uh, AI engines underneath that, um, you know, Netflix, Spotify, uh, Goodreads are, are, have recommender applications for movies, songs, books, and so on. Um, and if you think about the recommender that, ne that Netflix uses, there's a set of latent variables underneath this that, um, you know, things like British detective series or period pieces or food uh, shows that are the software, you know, estimates that uh, underlying latent variable and that's used as part of the suggestion. And so there's a variety of ways that you can have um, these suggestion engines mine the uh, data 
uh, for associations and relationships between variables that um, allow the recommendation to occur. Uh, so these uh, recommended systems have uh, been making it out into a variety of areas. And you think about what happened, you know, back in 2007 when that original Netflix million dollar challenge was put out there and, and won by the team from Belcor. Uh, fast forward to 2012 and there was a pilot out there, House of Cards, um, that was being shopped around uh, Hollywood. Uh, and most of the studios wanted to run a pilot because in, the, in 2012, there was about 100, well, 113 pilots were run at a cost of $400 million. Only 13 of those got to season two. So everybody wanted to hedge their bets. Well, Netflix had this, um, this recommender algorithm. So they, they looked at the latent variables. They played the plot uh, of House of Cards through that um, layer and said, hey, we've got an audience for this. So they did not really need to do a pilot. They did the deal, um, and it was, this was the very first Netflix original series. It was a success, and it's led to a bunch of other Netflix original series. And now here we are six years later, uh, where Netflix has spent $8 billion on original programming. Uh, they got the most Emmy Award nominations in 2018. They beat HBO. And that was the stated corporate goal of Netflix, to become HBO before they become us. Uh, and here you see the role and power of this uh, recommender engine that played in that, uh, in that process. So what are we are doing about this at TIBCO? We're trying to build it and make our software smarter and easier to use. And we've recently launched uh, Spotfire 10. And inside of Spotfire 10, it has a, an AI powered insight engine uh, that runs on search NLQ and runs on uh, through the graphics or data panel, a variety of uh, entry points into the algorithm that um, provide suggestions to you uh, in building a dashboard, creating an application, understanding and discovering insights in data. So the way it works is uh, when you click around on the data that you've connected to, um, the Spotfire 10 AI engine is already going through this data and, and developing models and associations between the, between the variables. So by the time you click on one of those variables, the software is uh, likely already figured out what are the variables related to that. It presents those relation, related variables in order of the relationship strength and in the most appropriate uh, best practice visual presentation, so whether it's a scatter plot for continuous variables or, or bar chart or um, whatever the case might be, density plot, uh, you end up getting these suggested variables that are related to your target variable of interest. You make a few mouse clicks and you end up with an analytic application. Now this interacts uh, not just from this data panel, but uh, also from the search. So if you click on the magnifying glass and you ask Spotfire a question, it will also um, invoke the AI engine. It'll figure out what are the uh, most related um, the visuals or relationships to the question you're asking. And again, present those in order of strength in the appropriate visual uh, type. The NLQ engine also allows you to ask Spotfire questions about how to do various things in the software. If you forget how to change a theme or whatever else, you don't need to understand the menu system. You can basically have a conversation with Spotfire and have it prompt you to create the, uh, the brush linked dashboard in entirely from that chat interaction. So this is, opens up a broad set of users to uh, a bunch of problems and you can throw whatever data you want at it. Um, you know, the team here at uh, TIPCO and our customers and partners have been having a lot of fun pointing Spotfire at their various uh, data uh, bases and data sets. Uh, to create uh, analytic applications uh, via this, this uh, set of suggestions that the AI engine uh, produces. So here's just a couple of quick examples. Here I've got a telco churn data set where this customer status is a variable that indicates whether someone has recently left the plan or they're at risk compared to a, a longstanding customer. You click on that and you see the relationships of the, uh, of the churners with a proportion of calls from other churners, uh, relationships to extra charges you received on your bill, for example. And so I click on a few of these and I you know, do a little bit of styling here. I can see that um, the uh, customer status equals churn, these bars here, uh, has quite a higher percentage of calls from at-risk people or previously churner people compared to the active subscribers. There's a bit of an interaction effect with the handset type here. Uh, and then here is a density plot showing the proportion of calls from a churner um, on the y-axis and the extra charges received on your recent bill on the x-axis and split by the active uh, subscribers here and the churners. And you can see the actives don't get many extra charges on their bill, don't get many calls from at-risk people. 
But here the churners get both of those things. So you can imagine, hey, you know, your buddy tells you, hey, you know, this particular um, telco uh, provider, you know, sucks, their service sucks. And then, you know, you come home, you get your monthly bill and you see these extra charges and you're like, yeah, they really do suck. I didn't expect those extra charges. And so that really adds to your probability of, of leaving the plan. You know, this is uh, applicable, like I mentioned, across all industries and all of our partners having fun with this. I was at an energy event recently where people were clicking around and Spotify was suggesting maps. Uh, this is a click here on the monthly production. It's suggesting various geology variables and, and locations, uh, you know, sensor data that uh, relate to production. And again, a handful of clicks and now you have, a, you know, here's your wells, here's your production, monthly production. Here's some sensor readings you're getting off of the equipment. Uh, and you've got an analytic application that shows the effects of geology and completions and equipment uh, performance and uh, location, um, that sort of thing, in a handful of, uh, handful of clicks. So what's going on under the hood here is we're doing a little bit of data prep. Uh, as you um, click around here, uh, well, we've already done a bit of data prep when we're doing the, figuring out the relationships between the variables. We're doing various binning strategies and cleaning up uh, messy data, uh, coming up with the relationships and doing the ranking. Uh, of the order of importance, and now you click, you make a few clicks, you add these to your dashboard. But you know, that's the, uh, just the beginning. So after you've gotten that uh, added to your application, you know, coloring this by another variable or adding a curve, these are all functionalities that are, you know, well entrenched in Spotify for doing uh, cool things on your, on your data and quite scientific things as well, very rigorous um, analysis that uh, set of options that Spotify provides. So it's, you know, a starting point, the, the suggestions uh, to building an application. So, you know, that's our take on, uh, on recommenders and the recommendation system that we have in, in Spotify 10. You know, another big success area for AI has been anomaly detection. Uh, so if you uh, think about that, um, what is a, a new observation anomalous compared to historical observations of that type? So the key here is to understand variability in the past and keep that, you know, really tightly uh, bound uh, and then figure out new observations. Are they anomalous compared to the past? So you've probably seen this on your credit card where you make a weird purchase, you get a phone call or your card gets shut off. So, uh, you know, fraud detection and credit cards, trade surveillance and other financial services use case. IOT is huge on this. We're doing a lot of work with Formula One that I'll talk about, but also the energy sector for uh, production surveillance, uh, predictive maintenance of equipment across all IOT use cases, uh, optimizing yield of manufacturing processes. And then out on into healthcare, where we've got some applications I'll talk today about monitoring patient risk. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of like predictive maintenance for humans, this uh, use case. So it's very similar to an IoT um, use case, but uh, humans as the, uh, as the subject. And then various customer uh, analytic applications. So preventing churn and you know, finding out the factors driving cross-sell or upsell. You know, anomaly detection is a very broad and sweeping uh, use case. So let's talk a little bit about the work we're doing at Mercedes as a fun example of this to get started, uh, where we're working on the R&D on the car, the setup, the configuration, uh, the race strategy. Uh, we've been working with Mercedes for some time now. Uh, you know, in the R&D area, reliability, like the gearbox, uh, you know, it takes about 15 milliseconds to change a gear, something like that. Uh, and the drivers change gears a lot on these circuits, you know, several thousand times in a single race uh, at times. So in the R&D lab, we looked at the configuration settings of the gearbox and we had several hundred variables to study there. And we looked at uh, finding anomalies in that space of those variables and to deliberately keep out the uh, configuration or settings of the, of the gearbox that had a high chance of an anomaly. So we don't want any slippage or any degradation in performance when someone's changing gears at, at high speed. That was a real success uh, story. I'm also doing a little bit of work to optimize allocation of the R&D efforts in the tunnel for aerodynamics, you know, setting up the car, uh, visual analytics on configuration and components for the car setup, and then the strategy, uh, figuring out um, uh, what are the best places on the track where we can try and overtake of the car in front and what are the factors that affect that, you know, our tires, our type, the condition, the gap, all those sort of things. Um, so lots of applications for anomaly detection, uh, combining data science and visual analytics and, uh, and streaming data uh, with the F1 work we're doing at Mercedes. And you can read about this work. Uh, we had a great season last year. We won both the, uh, uh, <coughs> the driver and the constructor championship. And there's a variety of uh, articles that uh, talk about 
uh, the data-driven work that uh, Mercedes does with us uh, in preparing the car and operating the, uh, the race. But you know, we didn't learn how to do anomaly detection or um, surveillance um, and IoT uh, with Mercedes. We've been working with Mercedes a couple of years. Uh, in the energy sector, we've been strong there for many years and looking at the, uh, the equipment, the drilling, exploration, production, strategic planning in the upstream, very data intensive, equipment intensive, um, uh, you know, set of use cases in the midstream for risk and trading, scheduling, downstream refining and supply. The energy business is a very digital business, lots and lots of data, and we're involved, um, you know, every step of the way there. So one powerful use case for anomaly detection is in uh, production surveillance, uh, where you see a number of wells um, that are instrumented, um, data coming across the wire um, on the performance of the equipment and the production performance. So measurements like uh, pressure, temperature, current um, from, the, uh, from the pumps coming into the control center, where we can analyze those data to look at uh, anomalies. So you can see here little spikes in the pressure going up here uh, over time uh, and the current dropping. We can model this uh, with um, machine learning model or with a set of rules. Uh, and then as those uh, events occur again, uh, we can see the pressure starting to tick up here. We can intervene and take an action. Um, now pressure going up can have, have a variety of root causes, you know, things like, um, you know, block to tubing or, uh, um, you know, gas build up in the downhole, things like that. Uh, and, you know, our customers have, you know, many, many of these scenarios that they can uh, put in place as rules or models on data coming in from the equipment remotely to diagnose or, you know, put in place a, a, a rule or a model that uh, is uh, predicts some imminent failure that's about to occur. And in that way, we can intervene before um, the pump goes down or is damaged in some way. Uh, this is a really huge uh, value use case. Now, that sort of uh, command and control with uh, core uh, IoT um, modeling and, and deployment on the, on the event stream um, is a solid um, way to go about things. Now, you know, in that sort of frequency where we're getting data maybe every hour, but, you know, across thousands of uh, wells, so the, the data certainly builds up. Um, when you're getting data every second, though, um, you know, a different type of um, analytic is required. And this is where we do the uh, intervention analytics right at the edge. So in, in drilling, we're literally getting data off the drill bit in uh, sub-second or second uh, latencies. Um, with uh, readings as, as to regarding the position of the drill, uh, the state of the drill. Uh, and we're able to put algorithms that we train on historical data actually into the equipment out on the edge to take, uh, take an action. So in that way, we can look at the, uh, the planned um, in blue here um, trajectory. And here's the actual trajectory. We can make a course correction. Now this is uh, particularly important in unconventional um, where the land zone for the drill is, uh, can be a fairly thin chunk of shale and it can go up and down. As you go laterally, um, you wanna stay in the band of, uh, of, of producing rock. Uh, and so having a handle on the drill path, the, the trajectory is, is pretty important. And so, you know, you might have a planned trajectory and here's the actual, uh, the analysis that you do on the historical data can be applied to the, uh, the real-time data to make a course correction in terms of the angle. It, the analogy here is, you know, you're driving to your friend's place um, for a party. You haven't been there for a while. You think you know where it is. You get lost. And then you, right here, you turn on the navigation system and we get you back on track, um, you know, in the minimal, uh, you know, the most efficient uh, manner. So... So in that way, we're actually intervening right on the data that's coming off the drill bit and right at the edge where the, um, where the action is. So both a core intervention for production surveillance and edge intervention for drilling optimization are two big use cases in the energy sector. And this is a, a really high value use case. Here's an article from New York Times about a year ago, big oil turns to big data to save big money on drilling. You know, talking about billions of dollars of savings using uh, Spotfire uh, to analyze information from the well sites. Um, and uh, you know, this is really a huge use case, high value uh, use case for drilling and for production surveillance. 
uh, you know, when they asked me, uh, how much do you charge for your software? I, I bit my tongue. I was going to say not enough, uh, given this sort of savings. Uh, ended up declining to discuss it. But bottom line is the value generated here by the by the software, uh, by the uh, in those use cases, is really significant. Um, and you know that's a a real value driver and justification for investing in digital uh, transformations of um, use cases like this. Uh, anomaly detection in high tech manufacturing. You know three big use cases in high tech manufacturing are run to run control, consistent product, uh, fault detection or anomaly detection and then optimizing the yield. Uh, so if you think about, again, you've got um, uh, tools on the shop floor where we're getting data directly from those tools and we're doing metrology uh, and we can um, extract features from that and do edge-based analytics just like we did with the uh, drilling equipment uh, right out there at the tool level. But as the, uh, the data come in um, and we get to look at it in more detail, the run-to-run -run control of the product, um, the fault detection we can do, uh, the intervention to stop the equipment or do maintenance or check the product. These are all processes that we can layer on top of those analytics like we saw for the, uh, the drilling and the production surveillance. In some cases, the metrology is uh, direct measurements. Uh, other cases, we even have models for predicting the metrology from the input data and they're accurate enough and they save time um, rather than doing the actual physical measurements. So that platform tier is an area for analytics as well. Uh, and then the data science tier, we're actually uh, just like in the other use cases for production surveillance and, uh, and drilling, uh, we're using uh, data science on accumulated data to come up with anomaly detection or fault detection models and models for run to run control. And we're using those to inject into this um, uh, platform tier to uh, make those informed decisions. Uh, and then uh, the enterprise tier looking at um, virtualizing data from the equipment, from the uh, metrology, into a set of standardized views, virtualized views that are ready for uh, the analysis and dashboarding and applications inside of uh, Spotfire. So you see the TIPCO product stack here for IoT analytics, all the way from edge intervention, uh, fault detection uh, analytics on the event stream, uh, data science to actually build the anomaly detection models and push them into production, and then Spotfire and data visualization and data virtualization to create a virtualized view across the manufacturing facility for surfacing into analytic applications for uh, fault detection, yield optimization. And we have a number of uh, accelerators and uh, templates and so on for doing this. So looking across the uh, manufacturing facilities, uh, looking within a particular manufacturing facility at the equipment and keeping a handle on uh, uh, this condition-based maintenance, and also the overall equipment efficiency is a big driver uh, of this. Uh, and then at the sensor level, where we're getting the individual readings uh, from the equipment or from the metrology, uh, looking for patterns and uh, anomalies that we can detect on the event stream and take uh, an intervention. So a similar type use case, and we have, I mentioned a number of uh, deep learning autoencoder templates and accelerators. Uh, using uh, Spotfire data science and streaming for uh, for that anomaly detection use case. And we have a way of doing this also in the cloud, in TIPCO Cloud, um, where we uh, fit the model, raise the anomaly on the event stream, case manage it to resolution, and use that to update the, uh, the model. Okay, uh, so anomaly detection is a big one. As I mentioned, patient diagnosis, this is almost like anomaly detection for humans or uh, predictive maintenance for humans where we, uh, we've done a, a work um, here with the University of Iowa for real-time surveillance um, of surgical site uh, infections. This is a big use case, expensive use case. Um, cost of hospital-acquired infections is in excess of $45 billion a year with lots of readmission costs. Uh, and this work that we've done with the University of Iowa for detecting um, you know, these anomalies and getting a prediction in real time of uh, probability of surgical site infection uh, addresses that huge uh, cost. We've been able to measure, or University of Iowa has been able to measure a 74% reduction in surgical site infections over the past three years, um, and huge reductions uh, for uh, across the collection of patients who are undergoing a surgery. And the, uh, the data here, we've got the electronic medical record that we are able to analyze with um, um, both visual and predictive models, uh, combined with data from 
uh, the real-time operating room. So merging the data from the operation with the uh, admissions and EMR data to do uh, analysis and understand the probability of infection. So you see the variables that uh, we've fit uh, in these models, the asterisks one here are variables that are collected in the OR uh, in real time. The other ones are coming from the electronic medical record. You see some of the uh, effects here and pretty good um, recall and precision on the model. Um, so, um, so yeah, this is a pretty, pretty well functioning uh, model. Uh, and uh, we're, well, University of Iowa's just gotten a contract for doing this uh, across a collection of hospitals with funding from uh, uh, CDC, NIH, um, where we're going to look at the, the analysis that we've done uh, that I just presented um, in combination across a number of uh, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, getting some borrowing of strength uh, of the models across, um, across that environment. Um, so we've got you know, a number of these uh, you know, hospitals here, I guess uh, six or seven or so hospitals participating in this, um, in this next step of this project uh, and uh, lots of press coverage for uh, predicting which patients will suffer from this um, surgical site infection um, you know, and the value that this uh, brings. Now, speaking of value and impact on, uh, on our daily lives, uh, I wanted to close with one more example of uh, AI, we're calling AI for social good. This is some work we were doing with a nonprofit in San Francisco uh, called Tipping Point um, and, uh, and also the SF, uh, San Francisco Office of Financial Justice, uh, looking at uh, the impact of parking citations on low-income drivers. Um, so here we brought this into uh, TIPCO Data Science. We set up a workspace. This is a collaborative environment. Well, the, um, Ashley here is a, a member of Tipping Point. We had our own internal data scientists forming a team here, setting up this uh, uh, collaboration. TIPCO Data Science brings people together, brings data sources together, uh, and uh, allows you to create work files against the data sources to um, you know, develop the data science models and uh, do the feature um, engineering, all in a point and click environment. So we're able to bring the data in here and uh, join these data together. You know, fortunately with San Francisco, they issue license tags uh, sequentially. And so we were able to impute uh, the age of the car uh, from the license tag, which then allowed us to um, understand the effect of car age on citation in different neighborhoods. We looked around uh, San Francisco, you know, the, the most affluent neighborhoods here in the, uh, in the red, the most affordable here in the, uh, in the gray, um, and understanding then uh, the citations, uh, the different amounts of citations uh, by different violation types, uh, by make of the car, by age of the car. Uh, we're able to get a view on this and uh, actually predict the value uh, of the citation and frequency of the citation as a function of some of those variables. And what we found was really interesting. The, um, for different types of tickets, older cars were getting more uh, on the citation in cost than you know, newer cars. And this was exacerbated with, uh, let's say, a ticket for plates and registration here, 30 bucks more for older cars in certain neighborhoods. And it really felt, uh, well, it looked like there's quite a bit of, you know, un, a bit of bias or discrimination in the, the writing of the ticket in different neighborhoods for different um, ages of cars. Uh, we really found some um, great insights there. And the cost of, um, paying these tickets um, for low-income people is, is really high. Uh, and then if you don't pay on time, the, the uh, late fees are off the, off the charts um, and uh, you know, just too expensive to pay for a lot of people. Um, so we were able to present these results to uh, the uh, San Francisco uh, Transportation Authority um, and they were very receptive. They basically looked at this, they put in place a, uh, um, a bit, three different things. They uh, put in place uh, this top right hand corner, if you have old or delinquent tickets, uh, you can sign up for a payment plan and get uh, late fees waived. Um, they also put in place a community service program. So you could actually work off your citation, um, you know, in addition to having the, the payment plan and the forgiving of the, uh, of the late fees. So really it's not very rare that you get this type of impact in policy. Uh, and we're pretty excited about the work we've done there. Um, to change, you know, change that policy and the effect we're having in the in patient in the hospital setting as well. Okay, so there's just some examples of uh, uh, these uh, AI on demand use cases where 
you know, the, again, the common thread in the recommender systems, patient diagnostics, uh, anomaly detection, these are um, algorithms and uh, data analyses put in place on historical data, uh, but then used and deployed against an event stream or real-time data you know, to take an action and drive an impact. You know, it's not enough to just have a, an insight in a report, you know, taking it to conclusion, driving an action uh, and generating the value is what we are uh, talking about. So you can go to our community site and take a look at some of the resources that we have there. There's also a partner exchange where you can download some resources of, uh, in this area. And uh, with that, I, I thank you uh, for your attention today. And we'll be coming out, uh, we're taking this show on the road. I think we have a 10 city tour across the United States in, uh, in March and, uh, and, and April. Uh, so stay in touch. We'll be sending out some materials and invitations, uh, community site with some of the uh, uh, use cases and uh, a schedule for when we're going to be in your uh, neighborhood. Uh, and you can always contact uh, me on email and, uh, and follow my Twitter feed. That's where you know, the announcements will come out about this series and frankly about you know, everything we're doing in data science and analytics at uh, TIPCO. Thanks everybody, have a good day.